Good evening. <laughs> Research into nutrition for preterm babies began over 100 years ago. But back then, there was a much more pressing challenge, and that was just to keep the babies alive. As you can see from that photo, the main issues were breathing and feeding. And in 1916, only 15% of preterm babies survived. And over half died in the first three days after birth. In the next 50 years, there was some progress. But in 1963, when Patrick Kennedy was born, at thir around 34 weeks gestation, he died two days after birth of respiratory distress syndrome. This was because at that time in the US, there was no treatment for babies like Patrick. But Patrick's death sparked new interest in preterm birth and in neonatal <clears throat> nutrition. So today, almost all babies like Patrick survive. In 2016, there are 15 million preterm babies born each year. That's one in 10. There's increased survival at much lower gestational ages, 23 to 24 weeks is the earliest, and much lower birth weights. But preterm birth has long-term effects on development and disease risk. So for example, up to half of the smallest preterm babies have some form of neurodevelopmental impairment. So this may range from something quite mild like needing to wear glasses to something more severe like cerebral palsy. They also have an increased risk of obesity, diabetes and heart disease. And because this affects up to 10% of the population, that means it's a, a significant public health concern. But these long-term effects can be influenced by early nutrition. Preterm birth has been described as a nutritional emergency. That's because these babies have very low nutritional stores and because they're very challenging to feed, especially in the first few days after birth because there are limits to the volume and concentration of the fluids that they can tolerate. This means that they have a, a very low energy and protein intake. And many preterm babies grow poorly. And this affects their, increases their risk of having a small stature and having effects on body composition and long-term metabolic effects. But most importantly, it can affect their brain growth at a time when their brain is growing faster than any other time in the life cycle. So that's from about 23 weeks gestation to 27 weeks. And you can see that even in the last five weeks of pregnancy, the brain increases in size by about 50%. A period of nutritional deprivation like this is often followed by rapid growth. But rapid growth also brings risks. So there may be a trade-off between development and metabolic risk. In this study of the in the 1980s of preterm infants, those who had faster length growth in the first four months after birth had a decreased risk of having a low IQ, but they also had an increased risk of being overweight or obese at eight and also at 18 years of age. And this may be particularly important for boys because preterm boys don't do as well as preterm girls. They have increased risk of death, they tend to be sicker, and so they have longer stays in hospital, and they also have an increased risk of neurodevelopmental impairment. Boys also seem more susceptible to the effects of suboptimal nutrition in the early days, and when we give them nutritional supplementation, they also <coughs> seem to have metabolic outcomes that differ from girls. <coughs> At other times of very rapid growth, such as adolescence, boys have higher nutrient intakes, in particular protein, than girls do. But for preterm infants, we consider their requirements to be exactly the same, and we prescribe the same nutrition for boys and girls. This graph shows the cognitive scores of term-born boys and girls at six years of age, and compares it with preterm. So you can see that the term-born boys and girls both have very similar cognitive scores and that they are higher than the babies, the um, six-year-olds that were born preterm. But what we also see there is that the boys have lower scores than the girls. 
So it may be that we need to be thinking about boys and girls differently and perhaps even feeding them differently in order to achieve the same metabolic and neurodevelopmental outcomes for boys as we do for girls. So we know that nutrition in early life is a key determinant of growth and long-term health and that preventing these deficits seems better than having accelerated growth. So the crucial question is, what is the energy and protein intake that's needed to achieve optimal growth and development? And we don't yet know the answer to that question. But here's what we're doing at the Liggins Institute to find out. We've identified that nutritional intake in the first week after birth is very important for later growth. So this graph shows the protein intake of a fetus in utero, a baby during pregnancy, and that's followed by the actual intake of a group of 50 extremely low birth weight babies from Auckland City Hospital from an observational study that we did over there. This is the intake that the babies over the road are having right now. Um, extremely low birth weight babies. What you see inside that red box could be described as a serious nutritional insult at, a t at the time of most rapid growth in the human life cycle and especially the most rapid brain growth. So and perhaps in order to achieve the growth for preterm babies that would have occurred if they hadn't been born preterm, we need to be looking at matching their intake that occurs during pregnancy. And this is the basis of two studies that are being done at the Liggins Institute. These studies are both funded by the Health Research Council. The first is the, the Diamond Study, um, which is a study in looking at early nutrition in moderate to late preterm infants, those born at 32 to 36 weeks. And the second one is the PROVIDE Study. This is a study looking at whether early nutrition intake, in particular early protein intake in extremely low birth weight babies, those born with a birth weight of less than one kilo, whether that protein can improve their neurodevelopment. Protein is made up of chains of amino acids. These extremely low birth weight babies that I've been talking about need to have intravenous nutrition, that's nutrition via a drip in their first few days after birth, for about the first two weeks actually, um, because they're not able, they're too immature to tolerate enough breast milk to meet their requirements. So we give them nutrition via a drip. And this is um, given as a mixture of glucose and protein and fat. The protein in this intravenous nutrition is given as an amino acid solution. So the PROVIDE study is an international multi-centre double-blind randomised placebo-controlled trial of an extra one gram of intravenous protein as amino acid solution for the first five days after birth. This is like a little protein chaser um, of an extra 30 to 50 percent on top of the intravenous protein that they're already receiving. So half the babies get that extra protein and the other half don't. This extra protein is being given by the umbilical arterial catheter and that's a way of making sure that the babies have that extra protein because in previous studies it's been really difficult to get much of a difference between the two groups when giving some higher protein and others the normal amount of protein. So the primary outcome of this study is survival free from neurodevelopmental impairment at two years. Secondary outcomes are growth, clinical outcomes and body composition. What's unique about this study is the sample size. This will be the biggest study that's ever been done looking at this issue in extremely low birth weight babies. This study began in April 2014 and all six level three neonatal units in New Zealand are involved. We've got two Australian sites starting, um, one next week and one in a few weeks after that. And to date, we have recruited actually 211 babies, because there was another one this afternoon, which is still 49%. We've also just started the two-year follow-up of the babies around New Zealand, um, the first babies that were recruited. As part of the study, we've been able to get access to the newborn metabolic screening results um, for these babies. You may know this as the Guthrie test. 
And this means that we can look at the amino acid concentrations in the blood of the babies. We've got some preliminary results, which I'll show you, for 119 babies at six sites all around New Zealand. And we have results available for the amino acids that are listed on the slide. On the day of birth, there was no difference between the boys and the girls for these amino acids. But on day five, these four amino acids were higher in girls than they were in boys, which we think is very interesting. Bil amino acids are the building blocks of protein, but they're also very important because some regulate the key metabolic pathways that are necessary for repair, growth and immune function. Too little of one amino acid, just one, can impair growth. But too much of one amino acid can be toxic to the developing brain. So it's very important to have the right balance. What we're interested in is, are the boys and girls using the, the protein that we're giving them differently? And are the high amino acids too high, or are the low ones too low? So whether these differences are associated with short or long-term outcomes needs further investigation, and we intend to do that as part of this study. So in summary, preterm birth is a nutritional emer emergency that may need to falter in growth and long-term health effects. And there's wide variation around the country in nutritional intakes and those effects between the sexes. The PROVIDE study will, will pr provide the first direct evidence of whether more protein is better for extremely low birth weight babies, and perhaps whether it's better for boys, or for girls, or for both. And it's a simple, inexpensive intervention that, if it's found to be beneficial, could easily be implemented all around the world. There's still a lot that we don't know about preterm babies, but this research has the potential to answer at least one of the really important questions before another 100 years goes by. And I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of the people listed on that slide. Thank you. <laughs>